In this test, we will assess the guns with 20 rounds each, firing at 100 yards. We'll favor bursts of automatic fire and find which is easiest to hold on target. So one would expect, because this gun is by far the heaviest gun that we're working with today, it ought to have the most controllable recoil, and that is definitely not the case. The problem is with this bipod right in the middle of the gun, right at the balance point, every time you fire, the gun's doing this. And it's actually really difficult to keep a group on target. I think the balance point combined with the fact that it's a toggle lock, which therefore doesn't you know, have a linear unlocking cycle, it actually throws mass you know, out of the path of recoil, means that this thing just goes right over top. Talk about bouncy. It is, uh, no matter what, water or not, it's always gonna bounce on you. You're always gonna lose sight of that tight within the second shot. Like you're never gonna be able to realign your second shot every time, so I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain my second shots were not on target. <laughs> Good luck if they were. So I have a strategy that I have employed to see if I can take the lead, because after every shot, this thing jumped up and to the left as hard as you could possibly imagine. So I just started shooting for the bottom right dirt. So hopefully my second and third rounds are somewhere in that paper. Uh, I agree with Ian on the balance point. It definitely uh, feels good when you first get behind it because every other gun I've had to sort of kind of get it up and hold it, you know, up into my shoulder. So at first you get excited because you go, oh boy, this one's right where my shoulder is. I can lock in, and it's so pleasant. And then you start shooting. That said, what this does bring to the table is capacity. So we didn't see this in just a hundred yard grouping test, but in theory, that's where this gun is going to make up for some of its other shortcomings. I feel like this is not going to be where this thing is going to perform. I think I'm going to agree with others in that it's this one's going to probably dominate in destructive power, but as far as accuracy with this one for lying prone, it's just not going to do it.
I'm gonna say, number one, I can't see what the gun's doing half the time. I don't have a strong indication of ready round or bolt forward or back. Like there's no visual indicator back here that stands out. I'm sure there is one if I look closely enough, but you know, we're kind of running and gunning and it just, I feel like I'm getting lost in the operations on this gun compared to a lot of the other ones that are out here today. The sights are not that bad for the first shot, but they bounce around. In fact, to me, they're kind of bouncing low into the left. I tried a little bit of a different, you know, first holding back here, then trying to brace here. To be honest, it didn't make all that much difference. I would definitely agree with the boys on this one. That thing definitely does pull your left a bit. And honestly, I just feel like a, a long burn on this one. It's, it's not really possible to stay dead on target. Like I'm, I'm, it's already tilting me a little bit to the left. So that's a bit, that's a bit rough. And again, I'd echo targets definitely walk. I feel like it's pulling me left. Um, and it just, again, I can see why people do not like how much you have to look at what you're doing and think about what you are doing with this gun instead of paying attention downrange. Other than that, like I did feel like a lot of the recoil was linear and there wasn't much to it. Hopefully I got something on the target. I guess we'll find out. So I am going to say that I tried the good old World War II get your elbow under and that mag just chewed up my forearm. So that is probably not the winning strategy. That was actually harder than I expected. I thought this would be really kind of a walk in the park. There's no way to keep that thing from climbing. Like it's honestly more than a two round burst is probably too much on this one. The problem is with no bipod to be able to push against, every time I started shooting, this just climbed up off the target she just climbs. Um, there's not really a good way to get down on this gun short of getting a perfectly stacked set of sandbags or something. I, my arm is super short so unfortunately like for me I was having a hard time just even reaching to the forward stock in order to even grip it so. Sights are extremely clear. So I'm hoping that I have like six or seven good hits, one for the start of every burst, and then kind of anticipating that the rest went over the guy's head. Yeah, as far as prone goes, this was not my favorite.
and this time I am actually out of ammunition. So, uh, impressions, number one, I don't know where to put my head. Getting a sight picture on it is challenging. Oh, this is god awful. Like I have to be in such a weird position, angled so far off to the left that it feels like I'm not really able to get a good sight on the gun. Uh, if I go too far back, I'm gonna get knuckled in the eye. Um, even with this extender here, I got a big head and I'm trying to get pressed up against it. Because of the large mass of the recoiling parts, holding it on target after the first shot is challenging. It felt like after every shot or two, it was pushing me back or pushing me off target. Like it really felt like the gun was fighting me every step of the way. Uh, it definitely has that uh, A5 double impulse, that long recoil coming back on you like a freight train. I was trying to go with two shot bursts consistently because we really are looking for how the, how the guns perform in full auto. Shooting them in semi-auto may have been the better option in many circumstances, but it's really not what we're looking for in this test. The slow rate of fire is genuinely nice. The rate of fire on this is so slow that it's very easy to fire si uh, single shots on full auto, and I did a couple of those unintentionally, actually. The bipod is not terribly positioned, but it seems like, especially for me, end up carrying a lot in my elbow and I can't quite get it welded to my shoulder unless I'm pointed down into the dirt. Like it very much wants to be down when I'm actually squared up. Overall, it actually felt pretty good. I'm really curious to see how that turned out. Out. Took my hearing protection off.
<laughs> I have to be very frank that this is by far the worst automatic or automatic uh, rifle or light machine gun that I think I've ever shot. For me to get the sight down what I think is low enough, more on that in a moment, I have it almost perched up on my shoulder like I'm blooping a tube. I can't even line up inside the V-notch in the rear sight. It's so far off to the left. I can't actually get my head behind. I'm squeezing as hard as I can. You see me struggling. The sight notch in this is substantially deeper than the standard eight millimeter Shosha. The sight is so deep that the sight adjustment block that wraps around the rear sight seems to be cutting into your sight picture. Problem is that I can't even see what I'm aiming at. And it is virtually impossible. In fact, it is pretty much impossible for me to get a sight picture on it. Hopefully I hit something on the target. That's just dang awkward. Like, I don't even think I got any on target. I would like to think I got some. The recoil on this is noticeably more severe than on the eight millimeter guns. That recoil, like where you're having to line your cheek up, it's just, it's rubbing your cheek kind of raw right there. So yeah, not the most, not the most comfortable lying down. There are, there are good reasons why uh, US forces use these for training, <clears throat> training and almost exclusively not for combat. It is so nice to have a gun actually designed to be fired by humans. Okay, so yeah, I'm sorry. I did probably have a little too much fun with that. Very easy to manage, very clean sights. Sights are pretty easy to read. That V-notch, uh, not very deep, it, it's, it's, it's very clear read. There's a little interesting discrepancy between the semi-auto and full-auto trigger functions on this, which is unique to these really early Madsons. That trigger, you get halfway into it, she fires the first round, and then you have to keep on pulling to a degree that you're pretty much guaranteed to get a long, long burst out of it. But no, she really does just have kind of like a linear recoil with her. It was holding on target well enough that I just couldn't help myself and I dumped the whole thing. I probably should have done short burst. I feel like the front bounced around on me a little bit. I may have not hit all what I wanted on target. I feel like I did some pretty good damage on target, if not for the fact that, again, I would have just continued semi-automatic and drill the hole and instead trying to sort of over creep that trigger this odd rhythm is the only thing that was really taking me off paper. Oh, coming off the show shot, this is just such a blissfully wonderful gun to shoot. That was extraordinarily nice. 
so far of all the guns we've shot, this has been by far the stablest. And the recoil is definitely the least of all of them because it is a very linear, very soft recoiling system. The smooth action, the smooth recoil, Barely any noticeable recoil. It's incredibly linear, it's incredibly light. I suspect that weight may come back to haunt us later on. The pans always seemed finicky to me. Not great, but not awful bipod. Trained crew could run this very, very well, I'm sure. It's kind of like a rifle trigger in that it's it's not like super heavy, but it's not super light. It's kind of middle of the ground. The trigger feels like a rifle trigger, just a bit too heavy. The sights actually stayed on target and I was able to watch my follow-up shots and make sure they were actually good. The rear aperture is great, uh, a little bulky being that it's so squared up. The sights are fantastic. That aperture sight, it's so far back, you get such a clear picture. All these things went together to make a really nice shootable gun and I have high hopes for that group. It really is a lovely gun to shoot. All right, we're here for our first conclusions from our first test. So uh, just so you guys are aware, we're going to try to get data when available for these tests that are relevant to what we're trying to discuss. So whenever possible, that will be displayed on your screen. So don't worry if you're listening and not looking and you don't happen to know what number we're talking about, it's time to maybe look. So uh, as we get into these, Ian, I want to make sure that we're clear these are limited tests, like in real testing, scientific testing, we would need to fire each gun a hundred times and really get into it with multiple people. This is not a troop trial. This is very subjective. Even troop trials aren't scientific testing. Right. They need, not even those hit that, that threshold. This was what we can do in a limited amount of time with a bunch of guns that are a hundred years old. So we have some vague impressions and as much as we might be on the, the sort of path to what is correct, uh, however, we have three different people shooting each gun. All of us have experience with these guns, maybe not these exact guns, but guns of this type and this age. And I think uh, there is absolutely a lot that we can learn from these tests without them necessarily being strictly scientific. All right, so in this one, we set them out nice and deep, and then we tried burst fire on the targets. In some cases, we didn't even manage to get bursts off because of certain triggers, but. Where are we at for the worst gun? What really didn't do well? We, I think we can actually say we have scientifically proven that the 30 out 6 <laughs> Shosha is not a very good gun for 100 yard grouping. It no. really was quite terrible. I, if they had put a scope on it though, you know, that's what everybody tells me. That's cool. Then you could have bruised your cheek and your eye. <laughs> right? And still not hit anything. <sighs> that is the only gun to give you a bruise today, wasn't it? Yeah, actually, right there on the oh, cheek. Yeah. I, I made the decision. I was like, either I can try to get something on target or I can come away bruise free. I went, screw it. Just put my cheek a little further back. And I'm I'm fairly certain I nailed my one shot that I nailed with both of them by just going a little further back. Worth it. So interestingly, I actually, this is secondhand, but I have um, a secondhand interview with an American Expeditionary Force veteran from World War One who was a Shosha gunner. And what he described actually doing was not this, the, the official French doctrine of like the guns pointing this way and you angle your body like 45 degrees to the gun and bring your face substantially far forward on the receiver as you see all of us doing with it. Instead, he said what they did was just take like a burlap sack or other cloth, wrap it around the stock of the gun, that plug at the back of the receiver, tie it down and then shoot it American style right behind it like a rifle. And just take the whack, but bu buffered the whack. And I've tried that. And it's actually very comfortable. You get some, you wrap, wrap some cloth padding around that. Everybody tells us this now, by the way. I know, right? After we've got a headshot, you know like he did, you know, he doesn't say, he said nothing on range. He only tells us like today after we've it's done everything. It's not the official way to do it. It's okay. not how you're supposed mm -hmm. to do it, but it was the workaround for guys in the U.S. Army who looked at this and went, well, that's not how we shoot. We shoot like this and that hurts a lot. So we'll put some cloth on it. Mm. Uh, honestly, it wouldn't have helped us all that much. The 30 out 6 Shosha just has so much recoil. Yeah, how many, I think I had none on target. Yes, uh, I had one hit, you had one hit, you had nothing. I think that that's, we're not gonna give out, the, we're not gonna call every one of these numbers, but I think for the worst and the best, we could probably just tell you, yeah, yeah it was not good. So, what's uh, next? The and, and only close ahead, only shortly ahead of the 30-06 show shot was the 8mm show shot. Surprise. Uh, Which I found to be fantastic. Yeah, actually it is ahead only <laughs> because you got a staggering eight hits on target with it, which is quite remarkable. Uh, you know, it was the difference between being able to read the, the site and not. And then I, I guess out of the group of us, I probably managed to figure out sort of where it was lying and I took the right adjustment. Maybe, yeah. and by the way, very clearly, this is a collaborative effort. I know everybody's gonna tally this 
And we're probably going to see a lot of leading time from Ian because A, more experience with these systems, but B, more experience with various systems because you film yeah. with a show called In Range. Yes, and so you are constantly doing competition style shooting, modern competition style shooting with older guns. So you're constantly flexing these systems. So that experience really pays off here today. It, it absolutely did. Now, May yeah. and I, I, I mostly do editing and things like that. I shoot maybe three times a year at this point because I'm always filming someone shooting. And then May shoots all the time, but it always has to be very cautiously for what is a delicate, curio, not delicate, but it's a curio piece. Right. Yeah, we usually end up taking our time with everything that we do with them because why not? We've got the time and yeah. we're not really pressured for any sort of... So this is, it's been fun. It's been fun to hurry it up, but... Regardless, it's collaborative though, because now you're seeing what various skill sets are going to do exactly. and various strength, literally strengths, because we now have one female in the group. Yeah, definitely the weaker one of the group guys. You're going to see that in these videos. So I don't know, it's interesting to see what the total combined score is for these guns. Yeah, um, by the way, it's also worth pointing out, I think, that this was a recognized shortcoming of the Shosha in World War I. Um, the, the French doctrine basically assessed it as about a 200 yard gun because according to their studies, the, the vertical dispersion of shots at 200 yards hit six foot. Like you couldn't reliably hit a standing human beyond that. 200 yards. Yeah. And absolutely, yeah, it was kind of a close assault. I feel like at that gun. range, that, you know, to get it further out, we, they had bolt action rifles. They exactly. had something else that they could use. Yeah. Uh, so once we get past the Shoshas doing very poorly, we then have a couple of guns kind of floating in the middle um, out of our total 60 rounds fired. Uh, for the BAR, we had a total of 23 hits between the three of us. And for the Madsen, we had 24 hits. And these are both guns that we thought would do better than that. I think we were all yeah. expecting these guns to really kind of be in the top echelon, not sitting in the middle. Especially the Madsen, we thought, like, because of just how it just felt and looked more rifle-like that it really was going to do more on target in the center. And, and no, it was surprisingly difficult for that one. Well, there was one thing with the Madsen. Yes, I got all excited at having a gun that finally, in our progression of testing, felt like a properly designed gun that you could actually shoot well. And so I put, I did like two rounds, two rounds, and then just dumped the rest of the magazine, True. which was a mistake. And I felt it pulling off to the side. You can say it's a mistake, but you actually did have some pretty hard dumps out of two other guns and did pretty well. We'll cover those That's in a second. That's true. So it, it could also just be that the Madsen is light. It's a light, light machine gun, and therefore couldn't hold up to that system sustained burst like we see two of our slightly heavier ones that did that is true but like with me if you do like little short bursts or even semi it was doing better yeah, for you almost hits. did exclusively semi and yeah. by the way not because you meant to that was the progressive trigger that's, that's on just that gun. yeah, yeah. that trigger we'll, was just difficult. we'll cover that trigger more in one of the future episodes i think yeah we're, well, there's going to be other experiences with that yeah but. um so once we get past those we get to one of, oh and the bar yeah no tripod on, or no, no bipod, no bipod. On that. great sights not a bad trigger for an open bolt gun but no bipod. So every time you fire, it climbs and you can't really hold it down. If now, by the way, it climbs, but not nearly as much because I've fired one. The, the My experience with the BAR, I've never actually gone prone with one at that point, but I had fired it from the hip and I had fired it before from the shoulder and so has May. And yet I felt like when I laid down, I was like, all right, here comes that that wave. You know what I mean? And from prone, don't get me wrong, I, I get a bip, but it's very simple to just bring it back down, I really thought I was going to be up over the berm hmm. if I hadn't been bearing into it. So maybe I was over-prepared, but still slightly better than I thought when I was down on the ground. Mm -hmm. It was nice, but it's really a gun meant for semi. Right, right. I agree. Semi-auto, it probably would have been the best performer out there among them. Yes. Yeah, like, with its sights, I think so. Yeah. Uh, now, the, one of the surprises to all of us, I think, was the Hotchkiss. Yes. It was the very first gun that we shot in our sequence of filming. And so when we shot it, we got the impression of what it's like to handle a Hotchkiss, which is kind of like uh, taking an angry weasel and stuffing it in your shirt. Yeah. It's an unpleasant gun to shoot. Um, Imagine if the gun didn't want, I mean, it almost feels like the gun itself is a conscientious objector. <laughs> yes. It doesn't want to be in the battlefield <laughs> yeah. at all. It doesn't want to fire. It so, just doesn't. In fairness to it, it was really much more at home as like a tank weapon. And a lot of its features make good sense if you put it in an armored vehicle. Well, that's this version. So I should say our version of the Hotchkiss today, like you said, is the tank version. It's designed to be clipped into and used elsewhere. That's why it has the detachable stock. That's right. why it has the, the all this. But that only affects it, the pistol grip yeah. and sort of the shoulder placement. 
the cavalry style Hotchkiss are like the US Ben Amercies, which really didn't make it to the war. But these guns had wood stocks that were a little nicer, a little more stable. But I don't Not think that lot. makes Not up for better. the problems we had. Um, but when we shot it, we didn't have any context for what our hit numbers were. We got a total of 27 hits. So we thought that was bad. Yeah, we thought that was awful and everything else was going to just blow this thing away. And in reality, as bad as the Hotchkiss felt, it was actually pretty decent. It yeah. was our third best gun. It was above the 50 percentile level. Not only that, but very, very mild recoil. Very yes. easy to... It's actually quite easy to stabilize the gun in spite of probably the worst tripod. You know, the funny thing to me, this was, I noticed this when everyone was shooting. This was like the only gun I've ever seen as a machine gun where your first round was on and your second round was low. Yes. And it's because of this weird double articulated Rocking crow's bipod. foot tripod yeah. that it has where when you fire the first round, the gun comes back, but there's two points of pivot in the, the tripod mount. And so it kind of comes back and pulls down and then it pushes back out. And so I saw that when you guys were shooting. You'd have hit, and then you'd see dirt come up from the second round. You know, we haven't done a, any sort of in-depth work with this gun in our history show yet, but nobody has. I've got to find out why <laughs> they did that thing, because that is very yeah. over-engineered. They must have been going after something that I don't understand yet. Yeah. You know, I once saw an adapter to put a Vickers gun on that tripod. <laughs> no. Okay, let's keep, <laughs> let's keep moving. All right. Um, that leaves us with, uh, well, pretty darn good was the Maxim. Yes. Um, yeah. Which is surprising. Fix the bipod on that thing and it could have just been... Actually, fix the bipod or shoot it, use it aiming by impact instead of trying to use the sights. I think you got that better than... Certainly better than I did. Uh, not in this particular test, though. Um, uh, where's our numbers on that one? Numbers on the Maxim were a total of 35 hits. And we were all pretty close. A 10, a 13, and a 12. Yeah. All yeah. of us had nice little... like I think you had the tightest grouping of all of us, but realistically... <laughs> We all had reasonably the same numbers on paper. I had the tightest group and the lowest number of hits. Yeah. My group was first round here, second round off the target. First round here, second round off the target. Because the gun just pivots on that bipod. It just bounces. Whereas yeah. May and I tended to have started low and just let it rock up. And so we got a couple hits, but they're further apart. Right. And so you can really chase something at a good distance with that gun, very clear sights, and heavy, so that much helps, but... Just that jostling is. I can hard. remember. Us, I can remember us shooting that thing in Kentucky, and just the the like trench that essentially we dug into the side of that uh, <laughs> giant hill. It just rose up. You could just see. That's all it does. Is it just? It's a climber. And then the standout winner of this test, far and away, without any question or competition, is the Lewis gun. Uh, we had a total of fifty-two hits out of sixty. I think somebody's a little smitten. Maybe. We'll see through the rest of this series, but <laughs> I will say you did kind of treat the loose gun like a middle of the road gun. I, and so yeah. did we all. And we've, you, you and I I'm actually. I'm the only one nope. that sang it praises from May the very get go. From the very start of this, because May has handled, if not shot, all these guns as they've been coming in, you did say that your pick right at the start was. I don't know, I would have to go back and look at it. I can't remember your exact pick, but you said that you had high hopes for the Lewis gun. And he and I both said, eh, it's a bit heavy. But at 100 yards, uh, you were right. It's because I can just remember my previous shoot with it. Like, literally in Kentucky, the grouping, I just put my hand on the target and looked at it, and I went, this is barely bigger than my hand. That's impressive. And I hadn't seen any machine gun we have ever shot And you were wide open that on that. Yet. Yeah, just, we were just, wide open. You just pointed and... Yeah. That was the only gun in this test where you didn't actually lose your sight picture when you fired. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it is a combination of the bipod's not great, but it is stable and it's far forward. And low. And yes, it is one of the lowest bipods in there. And the recoil is very linear, so you're not getting a lot of wiggle up and down, back and forth. It's just, it's coming right back into your shoulder almost like a shotgun, back and, it, and forth. And in beyond even that, it's not, Im the bolt's not impacting the back of the, of the gun mm -mm. Um, on every shot. It's like, I don't know if it has time to completely decelerate in the receiver and then go forward, or if it just kind of kisses the back of the receiver with each shot. To be fair, I'll take some credit there. I took the extra time to really time the spring on this one before we went in, because I've okay. gotten used to the way the clock spring works on that. If you're a member of a Lewis gun team, you can just dial in the amount of pressure you want. I mean, just dial it straight on it like a, like a, it's just a coil spring. And then you clip it in and you fire it. If it's just hitting a little too hard, well, then you can dial it up. Or if it's just short stroking or what, you know, Whatever you're getting, you can just get in there and by the smallest increments, so sort of like 
you know, MG0815 theoretically has this on right. the side, but then they seem to stretch and get into the clock springs have just been great on those guns. The other thing is on the Maxim, you've got the recoiling barrel and arm assembly that comes back and slams into the receiver on every shot. And then the toggle thing does its thing. Yeah. The Lewis just so all so much of that energy is absorbed in the action of the gun that it's just a magnificent shooter. Um, and we see that in our results. Yeah. Every single one of us had a clear, discrete group. And they went from like this to like that. Yeah, we but, even took like transition pictures of the targets just to kind of see like each one of us to see and every single one of them just bam, that was yeah. great. And it was the only of the only one of these guns that we had that. No, the only problem with it is it hits low and to the right if you don't know. Yeah. So as we went, some of us got a little bit better because we were, yeah. by the way, we warn each other the whole way through this yeah. test. We're like, hey, go ahead and pick it up. So it's not a competition in the sense that you mum each other. We're actually collaborating to get the best score per gun across if all possible. of us. possible. Yeah. Yep. So. I think it's time to go to another test. Yes. At this point, yeah. All right, gang, if you want to keep watching, you can go over to cunarsenal.com and for a nominal fee, pick up the entire series as one big episode. Again, I want to thank Brownells, who came forward to help us with this project, taking a big chunk of the very heavy overhead for it. And in doing so, they've been our first real sponsor. And interestingly, they asked for no strings attached. So everything that we say about them going forward, well, it's our choice. They just came in to help in order to help. And that not only makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside, but I appreciate the fact that it was Brownells that came forward because they have been a very good advocate for our community. They have all the products you need. They have reasonable prices. They have excellent service. And let's be frank, they have embroiled themselves into almost no controversies like practically everybody else. I could not ask for a better partner than Brownells, and neither could you, because they stick to what they know best, which is supporting the hobby that you and I share. All right, with all that covered, if you'd like to continue watching without going to cnarsenal.com, you can just be patient until next week when you will see the walking fire test over at Forgotten Weapons.